thank you for coming here. Uh, I'm going to try to keep you entertained. I know that the speaker after lunch is a tough job, but you know I figured out I can get you guys going. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about redefining institutional quality. Uh, when I and so we all get the same page. We're going to go through this. I'm not going to give you a, a you know this is the agenda or whatever it is. Uh, we're going to talk a little about introduction, a little about history, we're going to talk a little about definition so we can understand and get on the same page. I'll give you the challenges that I found when I joined this, this institution and what we're doing to get it done and hopefully we'll have enough time for you guys to have some questions and we can get into a really good discussion. Uh, first of all, introduction. I'm Nestor Infanson. I got 35 years of practice. I have worked on 11 countries. I have built projects all over the universe. I have, I'm the proud, um, I guess, carrier of 800,000 miles with American Airlines. I've been around the world a couple of times. I work for all day on holy firms. You know, Perkins and Will, HKS, HOK. So I, my entire life has been with large firms. So I'm not used to uh, doing smaller projects. I'm an architect, I'm a lecturer, I teach at universities and I serve on boards. This is the first time that I get to be a client. And this is a huge jump for somebody who's been in practice to somebody who's now the client. As a result, when I joined this institution, my challenge was how to transition a system into a tier one institution. That means that we're in the process of building some real high-tech buildings. We're trying to do a lot more research, but we don't have the skill set or didn't have the skill set at that time. So, the history. Uh, we are going to be 100 years old next year. So we're on our 99th year of existence. We are the second, I wouldn't say the first, but we're the second within the UT system. We occupy 421 acres of mountains. We don't have flatlands in El Paso, or at least on our campus. We got 23,000 students. We have $85 million worth of research funding on a yearly basis. That is a $84 million job from 10 years ago, when we have very little. Uh, we have about 5 million square feet of buildings. We are Bhutanese style campus, we have more Bhutanese building in El Paso that the Kingdom of Bhutan has. So, uh, so that gives you a little bit more of a flair. Because of our vision as becoming a tier one institution, the last six years between 2008 and basically 2006 and 2012, we added a million and a half square feet of research buildings to the campus. That is this building, the academic building, we have the bioscience building, which contains a BSL Lab 3 that has been certified four years in a row with no problem. Uh, we can do better than some of the other institutions. We have the New Health Science Center, which has also some uh, computer simulation buildings and labs. And we completed the chemistry and computer science. Part of the vision of the campus is to become pedestrian. So, started on 2012. We are kicking about 500 cars out of the campus. We're converting the entire five and a half acres of the core into a giant garden. We'll be adding another 680 trees just to the core. We're excavating the existing arroyos where all the water is channeled through the campus. And on 2014, August 20, you're welcome to come to El Paso at UTEP. We'll have the unveiling of the first ever Bhutanese opera. So, we have critical deadlines. In addition to doing this work, we have to replace the entire infrastructure. All of our IT, electrical, gas, water, hydronics, you name it, is being replaced. Most of those utilities were in place since 1920. So we're very, very carefully excavating the core of the campus. So, for today, we're talking about redefining institutional quality process. When I joined the staff, uh, the staff has been there for a while. 
we have been facing a couple of different things. How do we do better? We didn't have a history of delivering projects on time, our own schedule, our you know, own budget, uh, simply because external pressures. So we started with the idea of redefine. How do you start the concept and reevaluate yourself and reconsider what do we want to be when we grow up? This has been really where we started. We are going to transform our department into something else. And the second part of that has to do with quality. We all know that, you know, we all, and so I can, you know, test right now, I'm not a quality certified guy, I'm an architect. So our notion was, you know, if you do a good job, you got great documents, you get a good contractor, you have a great project. Well, that never happens that way. We have to have some sort of quality assessment of the process. And what we started looking at are what are the things that actually impact quality. And we started identifying issues on processes, issues on skill sets, issues on understanding in our staff, their ability to comprehend the complexity of the projects. So once we said that within the first three months of my arrival, we sort of had a little big picture of what exactly is it that we need to be working on. So, challenges. Um, we are a steady institution. We have, actually we have more than nine, but we figured out that we want to keep it tighter for our presentation. Uh, we have nine key challenges that we face as a steady institution. First of all, funding. The latest metric in the state of Texas and gold bless your soul are not really that bright. So, since 2009, they're mandating cuts. Their idea is, well, you know, you can do it less. So, that sounds like a great deal. Uh, the only challenge is that, you know, the more you cut, the less you can do. So, that has caused some really big issues. In addition to that, we have what is called tuition revenue funding. We as an institution cannot borrow money. The state borrows money for us on our behalf, which we pay them for the right to borrow money for us. And in the last six years, they have not borrowed any money for us. Now, if the assumption is if they give us money this year, that means those buildings will be put in place by 2016, 2017 at the earliest. So for the last six years, we have not had any money to build new facilities on campus. Our population is growing, you know, our demands are growing, research funding is growing, but we can't build any new buildings. In addition to that, every year this legislature tells us, I know you have a $400 million operating budget, but we want you to cut it by 10%. Okay, so they're not giving us money, they're not giving us money for buildings, and they're telling us you can't have more money. So, what that means is we can't hire people. We can't replace people. We're sort of kind of like in a frozen zone. And this is a real big issue for us, because as we need to develop new stuff, we don't have the resources to go after. And I know that they're the pesky driver that I, we don't like to talk, the state of Texas doesn't believe in public-private partnerships. You know, they, they have this mentality that, you know, that land is mine and I'm going to build my own building. So, in the meantime, you're sort of kind of like stuck. Another issue that we're looking at is we have a lot of long-term contracts that the university has engaged in. They're actually coming to an end. We had a really good electrical rate with the utilities. Well, that contract is going down next year. <coughs> Our utilities are going to double in price. We had a good rate with the water system, the water utilities, and that's going down. The same with gas, the same thing with products that we buy, fuel, you name it. So our operational cost per square foot on our campus is increasing. And that is a challenge for an institution um, that is really tight and bound. Also, our resources are flat. I can only replace who retires, which is okay, assuming you retire. The only problem is when you retire, 
you, if you were as when you retire making eighty thousand dollars, when that position is open, it goes back to the base bottom line, which is forty thousand. So me trying to hire an engineer or somebody with experience and expertise at rock bottom dollar moving to a Paso from anywhere in the state is really hard. So that creates a really huge problem for us in terms of our staff and resources. A workload. I have 11 people on my staff. My average project manager handles 25 projects on a daily basis. Anywhere from buying a furniture, one piece of furniture, to a $4 million project. I have six, I have six projects that we co-manage on behalf of the university. They're $30 million and above. So I have a staff that has no real downtime. And this is continuous. We don't get them to slow down. Uh, and this is a challenge for us. The other project driver that we found is that when I came in, one of my first charges was to look at the five years of assessments of the department that had not been accomplished. We didn't have processes in place that were acceptable to the institution. We didn't have training programs that were acceptable to the institution. We didn't have the right staff that is acceptable to the institution. And we didn't have any money to go hire somebody else. So, we needed to go back and start instituting processes that my staff can actually deal with. Every year, I get evaluated by the entire faculty, you know, whether I do a good job or a bad job. So, if, you know, Anita, who happens to be the dean of the health department, our nursing school, she didn't like the fact that her chair was five days too late, she'll write me a nasty report, you know, and that's what it goes, and I have to go explain that to the president why I had that one. So, they also have a problem with the department. I get emails, actually I can give you a good one, I got an email last week about one department who wanted to know why does it take three months to buy a chair. And I'm trying to explain to them that half of the problem is not me, it's the purchasing department who's got this whole process that we have to follow through. I can't just go buy a chair, I have to make sure that I got the right chair, the right company, the right approved vendor, we got the right PO, it's got to get advertised, we buy the chair, and six weeks later, after all that month and a half, you get your chair. So we have a credibility gap with our people. Our projects are tended to be late, our budget tended to be out of whack, our schedule tended to be really bad, and our people, my people, did not talk to my clients. A project manager will get a call from the dean and he will respond two, three weeks later. Okay, now in private practice like we all are, you'll be fired. Okay, I can't do that. I have to work with them. So, the next one is our space needs are increasing. Right now, I need more space. I need another 400,000 square feet of scientific research lab space. And we do strange stuff. I am remodeling 1,000 square foot lab at the tune of two and a half million dollars for a grant that is gonna last nine months. And when that grant gets done, that lab gets shelved, okay? And this is the sixth project that I've done since I've been there at the same amount of money. At that rate, I could just buy a new building. But I can't convince the administration that you need to think a little bit ahead. Okay. So, this is what we've done since then. We have tackled the project into different parts. First of all, we decided that there are some low-hanging fruit out there, which we define as the conceptual and pre-designed stages. Don't take a whole lot of time, don't take a whole lot of energy. It's just a matter of making some fine-tuning changes. Then there's a whole series of events that happen during construction. Does cost money. Because by that time, you already pay consultants, project is on board, they become change order, change orders become relation money, and so on. And then there are issues about at the operational stage. 
once the building is online, how much it's going to cost me to run that building? We have our operational budget for my department is $40,000. And the operate maintenance and operations for facilities, which maintains all of the buildings. And remember, we have 4 million square feet. Their budget is $2 million a year. That includes everything from repairs, roof, roads, paint, you name it. So we started with that one. The initial step was we didn't have a master plan. Well, we have one, but it hasn't been really updated. So we started with our landscape guidelines. We develop a lighting guidelines. We're working on pedestrian guidelines. We're working on energy master planning, wayfindings, and graphics. All of these guidelines are now telling my people and the user, this is how you're expected to operate on this campus. Yes, Dr. such and such. No, you can't have that chair because it doesn't fit our guidelines. And no, you can't put that sign on your building because it doesn't meet our wayfinding guidelines. So we're slowly corralling the entire university into one standard. And that standard has some flexibility. All of this master plans will be implemented by February of next year. Then the construction stage. This is where we got a little bit on everybody's knickers. We created a compliance department. People from my department, people from facilities, people from the uh, environmental health and safety, we all got together and during construction or during the design phase, we review every document. We do quality control. We do code reviews. We go back and say, you know what? This ain't going to work. Instead of waiting till after the fact and have to deal with those things. The other thing that we did, we instituted a best practice quality. We started defining exactly what was it that we intended to be for best value construction. Review, we are reviewing your submissions to us. We're going as far as saying, you know, no, you can't use that elevator system because they tend to break a lot. And no, you can't use that wall system because it leaks a lot. And no, you can't use that window because they don't tend to work a whole lot. And by the way, we're using this particular alarm system because it proves that it never goes down. We're having to go back and really institutionalizing certain elements of how we do business. The other thing that we did when we got into the operational piece, and we did this really stealth like, we started a systematically usage evaluation of every building. We didn't tell anybody, we didn't tell the department heads or anybody. We just went and figured out how much energy you're using. And then we corral that into how much energy you're wasting. <coughs> okay. So we went through this. We also hired a consultant uh, from California who is going to develop a model for us that he will actually systematically shut down valves and pieces of our infrastructure and determine what the impact to the buildings is. He tells us that he can save us, he can save our university about $70,000 a month in utility savings. And he's only going to charge us $100,000. So I figured out, hey, if he does what he says, even if he does half of what he says, we'll get it paid in two years. Then I got all the rest of my life to, you know, make more money. The other thing is, without telling anybody, we started shutting down the buildings at night. At our power plant, we went and said, you know what, let's take the temperature of that health science building, turn it off, and let's go turn out the library, and let's go turn out. And then we started turning out at different times. We started with, you know, midnight to 4, 11.30 to 5.30, and we just kept doing this for seven months. Nobody had any idea of what we were doing. For the last year, we've saved about $70,000 a month on electrical bills just by shutting down their condition. We're starting with the IT department. And actually, because we are, all of our computers are owned by the university, 
the IT department is putting into your computer an automatic shut off circuit. It will turn off your computer exactly at 8 o'clock at night and it will fire it up every morning at exactly 6.30 in the morning. Whether you like it or not. Because half of the people are not there. The other thing that we did is we started a new system for evaluations for all buildings 24 7. That includes everything from cleaning to maintenance to repair to operations. And we're going to have by June of 2014 a baseline for the entire campus that we're going to go back and give to the president and say, here, from now on, this is how we intend to operate the buildings. And if that's OK with you, nobody has complained about it for the last eight or nine months, so we're going to be fine and going. OK. The next thing we did is we started dealing with the fact that we didn't have a management culture. The planning and construction manage jobs differently from how facilities manage jobs differently. Although we're all in the same group, we all share the same resources, we just had a whole different way of doing things. So, the first thing that we did is we started to do teaming. We reorganized my department and we organized facilities and now we have basically four common core building systems or teams and they all report to each other. So that was the first thing that started to happen. And it's been very interesting because it started to develop a whole lot of more communication between us and them. We also started, in, uh, as, as part of this, we have now a new time management system and a new process of how we make projects and how projects are then executed. We also started with a compliance. We started to make sure that when a team is formed, you are actually, Matt, you're walking your project through all the best practices steps that we have created. When the job comes to you, the first person you call in is special resources. They determine whether you, what you're doing is good or bad, or whether it's complying with the mission of the school. You go to EHS, you find out whether it's asbestos or anything that impacted you. You go to the building shop and you find out what anything is there. Then you go to the architect group and you find out all their archival information. Then you get your project manager. Then you get your scope of services. Then you get it approved. Then you have a project. Because what tends to happen is somebody will get a call and say, hey, I need you to do this. And next thing I know, I'm getting a bill for, oh, we're doing this. And they're like, what? So we're trying to do this. The other thing is, we started a new system to better manage our clients. Every six months, every client that we have gets a survey. And it's not like, what's your job okay? It's like, how did Anita deal with you? Did she tell you about your budget? Did she keep informed about your schedule? Did she tell you about this? How often did she talk to you? How many times she came to your office? How accessible she was to you? Was she helpful? And let's talk about your project. And so we're going through all of this to make sure that our people understand that at the end of the day, we're serving a client. And that client is going to tell us when we're doing a good job. And the more we talk to our clients, the less problems we're going to have in terms of credibility. Okay. Let's see what we got. The other thing is we got everybody required to be project manager certified. We sat my entire staff and everybody from the facility side and they took the 40 hour training to do project management. So they're writing a whole scope of services and they're doing the work orders and the fishbone diagrams. They, I mean, they're just like going through all this. And if they don't have it, I'm not talking to them. So don't come to me and say, let's talk about this project because the first thing I'm gonna ask you, let me get everything that you need to do. And this has been very interesting because all of a sudden, now both sides of the house talk the same language. Every project manager that I have now, when I say, do you have your scope of services form completed, they know exactly what they need to have. 
And when my boss, boss, who is the CFO, she calls me and says, hey, what's going on in this? I just sort of email all the form. She reads it, she says, okay, I got it. So now I don't have to answer emails from her at midnight. So, we're also in the process of developing technical and processes manuals. Okay? Uh, I don't like this, you know, because I'm sort of, I'm a designer, I'm one of those guys who's, you know, I know what has to be done, so I know what to do, but my people can't have that luxury. We have protocols on how to email. We have actually time frames. You get an email from Anita, but two hours later you have to respond to her. And if you haven't responded to her, I want to know why. Well, I was on a meeting. Okay, then you get another hour to do it. We're doing that. We have. We have consolidated our contracts, we have established our work hours, we have established our uniform, not that we really want to, but we have to. We have established our operations, we have established what is required from every consultant at every step of the process. That way, you know, when XYZ firm comes to me and says, well, I didn't understand that. Well, you know what, there is in the document, it's in your contract, and it's in your form, what's the problem? Um, so, that's in the process. All of this stuff is going to be on our website. So, anybody who wants to go look at it, welcome to go at it. All the master plans are going to be there. It's, it's actually open for anybody. We're actually in the process of writing uh, standards. You know, if you're the dean of Social Insurance College, this is how big your office is. Oh, yes, and you do get a bathroom. And yes, you do get a, you know. And we're going to work through all of that. So. Ultimately, we will keep everybody on the same plane. And last, we have forms. There are actually 11 forms that require signatures and co-signatures. And each form builds up on the next form. And the last form is actually a checklist that you have all your forms approved. And you can't go, you can't pass each intersection of the road without having your forms approved. Simply because I have some project managers who go from A to D and skip B and C, and then when the project goes south, it's like, well, I didn't know. So we're avoiding that. Next step, we started looking at how to create a culture that focuses primarily on our clients. I come from a, a, actually, I had three lessons in my life when I was growing up. My first architect to a job that I had you know, I used to argue with my boss about erasing documents. He says, you know, Nestor, you get paid the same amount of money by the hour to erase as you get to draw. So keep your mouth shut and keep on erasing. Then I realized that, you know, I'm making money, so fine. The second lesson that I got was from my other boss who told me, he said, when the client asks you to jump, all you ask is how high. That's it. You don't ask him why. He knows how high. And the last lesson that I learned, I learned from my, one of my previous employers, Jonathan, who used to tell me all the time, you know, you're only as good as your last fuck up. You know, you can have 20 years of excellent practice, you miss one job, and man, you are the worst architect anybody has ever met. And we live in a culture, in a society, in a profession that is about that small, you know, and when you do something wrong, everybody knows about it. So, we focus on one. We have some challenges with people, so we instituted a 10-hour mandatory Bill Carnegie client serving and listening seminar. My entire staff, all 250, attended seminars. Two-hour seminars for five weeks. And they took tests and they're being graded. All of this has now been included into the annual evaluation form. Okay? The next thing that we did, we selected some of those challenge cat or trouble children, and I like to call them, and we're sending them to professional coaching. Now, and I'll pick an Anita. I says, Anita, you have a problem of being positive? Guess what? You're going to go to this lady here and for the next eight months you're going to meet with her twice a month and she's going to help you about becoming more positive. 
or how about management time, or how about responding, or how about scheduling, or how about dealing with superiors. And that is part of our culture that we need to make sure that everybody knows how to deal with everybody else. Then we took the next one. In addition to just doing surveys on our performance, we're doing surveys on individuals. Separate surveys that go to separate individuals. How was her performance with you? Did she treat you well? Did she respond to you well? Did she listen to you? Did she answer your questions? Not about her job performance, but her personal performance with you. And if we start finding that those are not working, we're having some challenges. And we're doing the same thing to our consultants. We're evaluating our consultants. You know, I have a good story for you. Uh, most of you, you know, uh, most architectural contracts require to have three solutions. I had an architect who tried to convince me that three variations to the same scheme were actually three separate schemes. And I tried to tell him, no, just because you change the color of the building, that's not a scheme. That's a variation to the same scheme. You know, and so we, you know, that architect unfortunately will not be working with us soon. Yeah. The next thing we did is we try to enhance each staff member. They're required to take 12 hours of continuing education mandatory every year on the area of ex expertise or field of their choice have one lady who wants to deal with general interiors and stuff like that, so she's doing that. I have one guy who deals primarily with mechanical systems, so he's taking his section in terms of that. And the rest of the architects and construction people can do whatever they need to do in order that it all complies with their goal, okay? The other thing is, we send them to a four-hour conflict resolution prop, uh, seminar because we had people who kept saying, well, you know, that's not what she said. You know, and I'm talking to the dean who's telling me, no, that's exactly what I told her. So, um, I'm trying not to be very judgmental when the dean tells me that my staff is not paying attention. I'm gonna be on the dean side first because she's closer to the president, you know? Because no matter what I say, She's going to tell the president that my persons or me are not helping. Got your cover. Okay. Then we started looking at primary best value. How to work on that? We have continuing education course courses that are being developed that focus on best value propositions. How to do best business. How to how to deal with the stuff that we purchase. We're working with our purchasing department and streamlining our purchasing procedures. How do we deal with that? Got you covered. All right, the other thing that we're doing, we started a new database. I've decided that, you know, architects don't know, don't know how to really price projects because we're not in the business of construction. So I have approached three two large construction company and one cost consulting firm. I said, would you be so kind and share with me your database? And they were saying, yeah. So now we have all of that. They're kindly enough updated every three months. So we actually get in some raw data that we can go back and tell our clients, this is where we think your project is gonna fall. And we started a peer review process. If I hire a new firm to do a lab, I'm going to hire another firm to check your work. So I avoid the fact that my guy really doesn't know a whole lot about labs, so he's going to get kind of bamboozled. My researchers always want the Lamborghini of stuff with a Volkswagen budget. So I'm now getting a peer review process put in place to make sure that at the end of the day, my $2.6 million, 1,000 square feet space is not really a waste of money. Then, in summation, so we get you guys some time. Ah, uh, there are really nine things that you need to work about. First of all, you make sure your vision is in place, you need to make 
make sure you you understand your staffing skills and capabilities. You know, you can go through this and standardize your process, make sure you benchmark your project. It's stuff that you know how to do. We just got to do it more. And the moral of the story is that my people are not being held accountable. Period. You know, if you don't do this by the end of the year when you get evaluated, guess what? You're going to get a really low evaluation. And multiple low evaluations is the only way I can fire you. Because that's, you know, that it is all performance based. Question. Oh, I know it's kept you all entertained. Yes, sir. Let's say I was about to hire, um, uh, let's say I'm going to do a, a rec center, an expansion to the rec center that requires a couple of, let's say, basketball courts and so forth. I'll hire a local firm because that's a small project. It's probably going to be about three, four hundred thousand dollars I'll hire a local firm to do that. Well, then I'll turn around and I'll hire somebody like HOK or 360 or HDR or one of the large sports companies and say, I need you to give me a $30,000 proposition to basically peer review what these people are going to do, make sure that we have everything covered. So your job is to receive their documents, go to the documents, review their specs, look at their visions, look at their goals, and then to say, hey, you got it all covered, or oh, by the way, you know, if you make this then two feet wider, then you can get an NCAA, you know, basketball court, which would be really cool to have for an extra couple of bucks. Or, you know, no, you can't do that because the mechanical system that he's proposing does not take care of all the humidity. That's what we do. We want somebody who's got that expertise to really review what we're doing. Right. You bet. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, hello. Uh, I, uh, I'm reading a book right now, uh, Super Freaking Omics, okay? Bottom And uh, one of the Underlying principles is that people respond to incentives. Uh, and uh, can you talk about that within your strategies? It, uh, you know, I, 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 well, I guess what I'm saying is, is I'm, I'm picking up like negative incentives, a lot of negative incentives. Uh, what would you say are the positive incentives? What would the and what would your staff see, say, in terms of, hey, this is great, there's something we can class, and this or that. I mean, can you expand upon that a little bit? What we're doing is, because, like I said, my, my, my budget is really low. I really have a lot of about $8,000 a year for travel and continuing education, stuff like that. So what we're doing is, if you're demonstrating that you're, you're doing well and you could use the training, we'll take it out of our budget and send you to do that. So that's the first thing. We're also finding that we're encouraging our people to take the licensing for architecture and engineering. Uh, we don't have an incentive program per se, but I have managed to move some money out of there to my uh, discretionary fund. And then we'll, what we'll do is if you pass a part of the licensing I'm not send you and your wife to go have dinner on my on my own. Uh, you know, we're, with the limited amount of money that we have, we're trying to encourage them to do other things. We've also created um, new positions. Uh, we develop a senior project manager and a, a senior program manager position. And if you continue to do well, we'll move you in positions, which means that your salary base increases. You know, and so we're trying to do. Uh, uh, as much as we can to make sure that you get what you need. And also, project assignments. If you're not doing well, you're going to get all the cheap jobs. <laughs> you know, and it's just that simple. And because we don't trust you with the big work, with the big projects. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, wow. Uh, well, you, a corollary to that. Yes. What's your assessment when you walk through the door of staff morale? Uh, when you walk through the door as 
I have a conflicting staff morale issue. They, when I joined there, we had a we had an employee who had sued the university three times, and we couldn't get rid of her. So it took me a year and six months of very carefully treating it like anybody else, documenting every screw up that she did, and she was fired. So then wrong, my staff now went up a little bit more. Uh, the problem with that is it sort of proved to everybody that now you can get fired. So everybody's like, oh, wait a minute, you know. They, everybody thought that you know you were immune because this person hasn't been fired in like nine years, and three other other directors have tried and couldn't make it. So now they're like, wow. The other thing that we start to do is we start we have more collaborative discussions. I don't walk in there and say, hey, this is what we're gonna do. I say, you know, I think this is what we need to do. This is what we need to go. What do you think? And then we talk about it, you know, and. You know, my dad was a shrink, so you sort of kind of corral people and move it into the right direction. At some point in time, they'll say, you know, I think we need to do that. That's a really great idea. Why don't we just do that? And you get it exactly where you want it to go. Uh, they're becoming aware that the pressures are coming. Uh, my latest threat to them, which is not really a threat, is I get, I have a chief financial officer who is really, really, literally inches away from the president. Every time something goes wrong, the president gets a call, Cindy gets a call, Nestor gets a call, okay? It's just like that, it's like the telephone. So I decided to my staff, because they, you know, said, you know what, I'm gonna give your phone number to Cindy. So, next time, don't call Nestor, call Anita. Go directly to the source. And that got them woken up, they're like, whoops, Wait a minute, I don't want that phone call. We bought them, you know, we're giving them iPads and phones, we pay for the phones, you know, we bought a computer, you know, anything they want, we take the money and we do it. So they can't come to me and say, you know, I don't have the, the, the tools, I don't have the skills, we're sending you to classes. And if you're not performing, there's something wrong. Okay. I've been told I have 35 seconds, so I want to thank you very much. Thank you for letting me talk about this place and what we're doing. And anybody wants to ask questions, feel free to call me. I have my cell phone. No, I don't have it, but there's my UTEP email address. Feel free to uh, reach out, uh, and hopefully we'll see you around. Thank you very much.